Oh god. Um, <laughs> what do we have in store? Alright, so my name is Ben. Um, I'm trying to figure out this microphone. My name is Ben. Um, I just finished TVB. And so I'm going to ask you guys a couple questions at the beginning of this. If you've been on TVB and have thought about some of my questions, please don't answer. Um, okay, so how many of you have ever done something for charity? You may have given your time, your money, your political capital, or your influence, but the full knowledge you never get anything in return. So if you haven't been on TVB, go around the room and say, you know, something you did for charity, you know, either here or abroad, uh, what you did, when you did it, and where you did it. So, raise your hand. Uh, all right. I, I work with TVB. <laughs> hey. Okay. Yeah. What else we got? Ed. I set up squash busters of Lawrence. <laughs> okay. What does that do? It takes kids out of Lawrence, Massachusetts, puts them into a squash program at Phillips Academy, tutors them, trains them, and hopefully gets them off the bad track and onto a good track. And okay. we pick them up in the sixth grade. And well, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. I'll be my dad. Who else here? Uh, you, uh, I helped build a greenhouse in Jersey. So. Uh, very cool. All right. So why did you do that? Let me start back. Uh, TVB is an incredible organization. Uh, I joined uh, a year after we started, um, joined the board, and um, uh, it's been, it was a no-brainer. I was trying to explain to someone last night at the cocktail hour why. It's, it's tougher than I ever expected to explain why. It was just a no-brainer. All right. And so, why did you start squat questions? I'm old, I've seen a lot of things, and I don't understand why Lawrence is so poor and Andover is so rich. Okay, and why did you build the Greenhouse? I thought it was just a great opportunity to kind of help uh, in an area that wouldn't have otherwise had this Greenhouse. In. Okay, very cool. So all, those are all really cool reasons as to why you gave. Uh, when people give their time and money, it's called charity. But when a really big organization or a country gives their time and their money, it's called aid. And so aid's purpose is twofold. In the wake of a natural disaster or a terrorist attack, it's used as trauma care. The other aspect of aid is how it, fun is how it functions as an agent of development. And so who here, non tv again, <laughs> thinks they have an idea as to what development is? Oh, maybe the same three guys? <laughs> Anybody, any ideas? Oh, Bueller? What do you mean by development? What? What do you mean by development? Oh, whatever you think. <laughs> So, so nobody? We challenge our assumptions. Well, that's, that's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so anyway, uh, a year ago I took a class on colonial African history with Dr. Shaw uh, at Andover, and I learned about the Berlin Conference, King Leopold II, and the concept of the Great African Cake, which was divvied up between colonial powers until those countries became independent, most of them in the 1960s. Uh, I was amazed by the concept of development, which I never learned about before, and the role of U.S. and Western powers in this process, and I wanted to learn more. I came on TVB to answer my own why. I knew there were plenty of you know what's, where's, and when's for me to work with, but I couldn't answer why I want to develop, why I want to help create change. You know, why do I want to develop other countries? Why does United Why does the United States develop other countries? And what should we hope to accomplish with development? Uh, seven months after I set out on this program, uh, I'm able to answer my own why. In my opinion, citizens of the United States should not develop other countries. We have plenty of work to do here at home like building greenhouses in Jersey, and uh, other countries are best served by the locals who can communicate effectively to create change. America, however, does have an outsized influence on the world, and we poorly use that influence with regards to how we assist sustainable development abroad. Okay. Uh, I forgot to use these slides. Uh, I will discuss two key missteps we have made as Americans and the American government, as well as the solutions I came up with uh, during my travels. The United States has unfair and inequitable patent laws and international property rights that make healthcare and sustainable agriculture much more difficult both at home and abroad. Our thirst for foreign oil and other natural resources has, has driven countries around the world to committing terrible atrocities both to their environment and to their people. In the wake of the tremendous amount of power exercised not only by the United States government but by corporations and other American interests, there is a relatively tiny amount of workers and capital going towards aid but they have neither the capacity nor the backing to outdo all of the terrible practice, practices that I'm going to outline here. My solutions are simple, but somewhat radical. The first solution would be to increase 
foreign direct investment in microfinance, as well as getting develop developing countries a, re uh, a reliable credit rating with which they can borrow money. The people who live in the developing world need money on every scale from the individual to the state level in order to develop themselves. With regards to more tangible policy, simple yet fundamental changes to patent law and energy policy like I've mentioned would not only physically change Americans, but the rest of mankind and the earth as a whole. In the week after we returned from our trip, uh, we had a series of meetings with the World Bank, various NGOs, and the State Department. Uh, the State Department, you know, I, we were all really excited for because, you know, it's the State Department. We do cool stuff, right? You know, everybody loves Hillary Clinton. Um, but we sort of, we saw the Foreign Service recruiting video, and we got a Q&A session with a State Department employee, and uh, it was kind of pro forma and pretty disappointing. Uh, one of my fellow students asked why Foreign Service officers are moved every two years, and the answer we got was because well, after two years, you get too familiar with what's going, on, what's going on on the ground. You get too familiar with a lot of the issues, and you get less familiar with what America's interest is, and you get less familiar with promoting American interests abroad. Instead of working with the locals, perhaps, just maybe, to develop them, maybe? Um, and so, where the United States refuses to sign landmark international treaties for fear of you know, infringing on our own sovereignty, we march into other countries, you know, regardless of their sovereignty basically do whatever we want under the umbrella of fighting communism, securing oil reserves, or national security. And so I spent the whole year watching how American policy, both foreign and domestic, uh, and how the work of American-based multinational corporations wreak havoc on the ground in all of the countries I visited. Um, and there are grassroots organizations all over the world uh, working with aid money, trying to develop nations that used to or still use CIA-backed dictators. Um, and they do fantastic, amazing work. Uh, I spent seven months working with them, but for every grassroots organizer or local developer, there are a hundred or maybe a thousand people in part bankrolled and sanctioned by the United States of America that stop that development from ever taking hold. If you look at the countries that have climbed the economic ladder to development in the last 50 years, 50 years in which the West has spent $2.3 trillion in foreign aid, only the Asian tigers, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, and these other small nations that had phenomenal economic growth in the 90s, and Turkey come to mind. You know, other than South Korea, these are countries that we had nothing to do with at all. They did it by themselves. Um, and so, which that sort of further justifies the futility of aid when so much work is done by the United States and other international hegemons to stop development and maintain the status quo. Uh, now, because America is the, world greatest, is the world's greatest power, Americans do receive uh, special treatment compared to other foreigners when they go abroad, especially in the developing world. Uh, in South Africa, I was working with Kate Abram, another TBB student, uh, assisting two home-based caregivers in the Crags, a uh, township out of Plattenberg Bay. Have we have anybody here who worked in the Crags maybe last year or previously? Kerland. Kerland, yeah. They also call it the Crags. Um, one day when Sandisa, uh, Sandiswa, our Osa caregiver, was away on training, uh, Kate was at home working on her media project, Mari and I, uh, Mari being my other caregiver, Oh, you're late. <laughs> you're late. <laughs> anyway, uh, Mari, other, our other caregiver, told me that we would be going to the house of a man who had died earlier that morning. From the outside, it looked like any other house, but on the inside, it was chaos. This man had died at around 6 that morning, and we stopped by at 8.30. He was in his late 70s, and the house was packed with his wife, kids, in-laws, and grandkids. People were sobbing, some were talking on cell phones, arranging funeral services, while others were minding the kids. Mari and I went into the bedroom and saw him laid on the bed. Uh, his open mouth pointed skywards, tensed as if, he, as if he was dying of thirst, trying to catch rain. His eyes were wide open. I have never, ever, ever seen anybody skinnier than he was. I could fit my thumb and middle finger around his femur, where you know, his thigh used to be. The thickest parts of his legs were his knees and ankles. I could count all of his ribs, and his arms looked like drumsticks. Not chicken drumsticks, but like drumstick drumsticks. Mari and I took off his clothes and gave him a sponge bath. Uh, I had to pick him up to turn him over, and was shocked by how light he was, although he was almost six feet tall. And also by the scent of death. Uh, it pervades everything, and even when I left the house and washed all of my clothes later that day, I can still remember how it smelled. Not disgusting, but definitely a final sort of smell. After we washed him, I helped Mari put a fresh t-shirt, pair of underwear, and shorts on him, and then we clipped his finger and toenails. Uh, after leaving his room and taking off my mask and gloves, I was ambushed by his wife, who thanked me in Afrikaans for the work I had just done. 
having an American doctor was an honor for her husband. And so I was traumatized for days. I had never seen a dead person before, let alone pick them up, wash them, or clip their nails. Uh, and it wasn't until a couple of days later that I realized that being a white and American, people assumed that since I was working with Maori and Sindiswa, that I was a doctor who knew what he was doing. Uh, I had no intention of going to medical school at all, and I certainly wasn't teaching Maori or Sindiswa anything. They were teaching me. Yet the fact that being a white American made others assume that I was an expert at 18 years old was indicative for me as to just how much power America and our experts wield. And although South Africa trusts our experts, I was pretty disgusted to learn how the pharmaceutical industry treats the poor and how a lot of that is motivated by these experts. So HIV AIDS uh, has torn South Africa, oh, wrong picture, that's China. <laughs> HIV AIDS has torn South Africa apart. Um, it's a gateway virus and it destroys your immune system so that a common cold can kill you. However, antiretroviral drugs can stop the virus. They can't kill it, but they can stop it. While pharmaceutical companies do provide aid to developing countries to have and provide some in the form of free drugs, there are not enough to meet demand, so developing world governments do have to buy them as well. And due to the United States international patent law, a company that invents a new drug gets a 20-year monopoly to patent that drug, and during that time, a company can more or less set whatever price they want. Now in the U.S., if you have HIV, these prescriptions cost thousands of dollars a year, which puts it out of reach for many poor Americans. The drugs for many of the ailments I saw in the Prags, in addition to HIV, high blood pressure, stroke, cancer, hypertension, pain meds, are all mostly products of the, of the United States, and as a result, benefit from not the house. Eden Organic Pharmacy only existed for a little over a year, and before that, it was converted, before that, it was converted to organic by a biochemical company that had been told by the Chinese government to, sustain, to expand sustainable organic farming. Although Chan Chi Yi was initially a little shy, by the end of my time in China, we would color together every night after dinner. At the age of three, Chi Yi, which is his nickname, is happy and healthy, even though his grandmother is only paid 1,500 yuan, or about $250 a month. He has all of his needs met, and he eats organic produce from the farm his grandmother works on. Now, while Eden is only a year old, and definitely rare in China, it is still one more sustainable organic farm than is being financed by the U.S. government here at home. And while, the United St and, and while we may have a greater quantity of sustainable organic farms, they are certainly <coughs> not being assisted by the government. Far more influential than the individual farmers soldiering on sustainably in America here, despite our government, and Amanda, who is one of these farmers that soldiered on, um, we're lucky to have her here. Um, <laughs> far, more far more influential than farmers like Amanda who try and farm sustainably, uh, is the m amount of money in Washington pushing to maintain the status quo of conventional, unsustainable agriculture. Take the corn market, for example. The United States produces an exorbitant <coughs> amount of corn, and American industrial farmers have come so accustomed to growing corn that the United States government has tampered significantly in corn markets to try and make it profitable, and even then it has to be subsidized. Starting at the supermarket, corn is sold at less than the price of production to keep food prices low, and corn is present in nearly everything we eat from high fructose corn syrup to corn-fed beef. Most, cor most processed food is going to be based around some element of corn. The United States provides so much excess corn, pri driving prices down further, that ethanol, you know, the fuel you, know, you put in some of your cars, was created in part to find a use for this excess corn. Some interesting facts about ethanol, it is not an economically viable product in a free market. If we have any Republicans here or free market advocates, you know, stick your fist in the air. But, you know, learn a little bit about ethanol. It costs more to refine into a usable fuel as opposed to normal crude oil, and it cannot be piped. It can only be trucked or sent by rail, which drives the cost up further. Even with all these normally economically uncompetitive outlets for spare corn, the average corn farmer still loses $1 in costs for every bushel of corn that they sell. So the government comes in with subsidies to, put farm to keep farmers in the black, but also dependent on government handouts. But agriculture isn't even that simple. In 1976, the Supreme Court ruled that it was legal to patent life, and all of a sudden, companies like Cargill, Monsanto, and ADM, who made pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizer, started to genetically engineer seeds get bigger faster. Through a series of lawsuits, farmers who save seed, which means they don't buy ge genetically modified seeds and instead keep the natural offspring of their last crop for the next one, were sued by big agribusinesses for violating intellectual property rights. If GMO seeds were that are found on that farm that were found on that farmer's land by accident. With the ability to patent life, big agribusiness could now patent any seed they wanted to so that it and all other like it belonged to them. Therefore, 
if a farmer saves seed from their own crop, but somehow big ag can detect GMO seeds either blown off of a passing truck or from another farm or brought by birds cross-pollinating or you know, by aliens or however, you know, in a percentage greater than 10%, then they, have to, they, then they have the right to take that farmer to court and the farmer has to destroy all of the seeds they have saved. The legal fees for these farmers, you know, who lose, who still lose a dollar on every bushel of corn they sell, are too much for most farmers, and so they usually settle in court, wiping out any retirement plans or college funds. And so with no seeds saved, they then have to buy from big agribusinesses, and it sets a precedent for other farmers in the area to think about saving seed versus buying seed, and it expands the market of uh, these big agribusinesses. And now because these seeds do produce larger yields, they exhaust the nutrients in the soil quicker which while perhaps beneficial in the short term, is not a good idea in the long term. As nutrient-poor soil will not be adequate fuel for future high-yield GMO plants, as well as being prone to erosion and other forms of environmental degradation once the nutrients are in the soil and get sandy and kind of silty. Synthetic fertilizer, herbicides, and pesticides make their way into the groundwater, uh, which are externalities that go unnoticed. Organic farming, by contrast, and if you have questions, you can talk to Amanda, um, is much more environmentally beneficial over the long term. It can lead to larger yields than conventional farming over the long term because it doesn't exhaust the soil. Uh, and so here is Chu Yi drawing a picture of a big yellow Easter bunny that was supposed to be me. <laughs> His government may have many policies that terrorize the environment, but when it comes to organic farming, we are losing to the Chinese. Now, while envir environmental degradation caused by conventional farming is serious, it does not even compare to what I saw in Ecuador. I spent six weeks living with the Satchelas, a tribe that ceased to be hunter-gatherers only in the 1960s. They are pacifists by nature and have lived in communion with nature for centuries. There are no words for nature or wild in Tzapiki, their local language. They see the jungle around them as their backyard, their medicine cabinet, and their pantry. But they rely almost entirely on Santo Domingo, a nearby city, for most of their food. They go two crash, cash crops, plantains and cacao. If you look here in the foreground, that's cacao drying. When cacao dries, you know, it's a great that can sell it for a lot of money, but it smells like rotting garbage until it's dry. Um, and so all of their money is then used to pay for food and living expenses. Uh, my host family, inclu uh, yeah, my host family uh, included my dad, Telmo, who is this guy, my mom, Gloria Maria, and my two host brothers, Danielle, who's 12, Sinto, who was 10. Uh, I loved my time in Ecuador. Each day was a new experience. Uh, from a very close call with a pit viper when I was bathing in the river, uh, I was shaved by a machete-wielding grandma who killed it, uh, to waking up at 4 in the morning um, to the screams of a chicken. To have those screams suddenly stop, and then to be served really, really, really fresh chicken for breakfast. Uh, and while historically the satchels are stewards of their environment, uh, the land around my house was a mess. There was trash everywhere, candy wrappers, plastic bottles, and Sylvester Stallone movies. My host family had everything Sly had ever made in a bootleg dubbed in Spanish form, which was totally awesome. Uh, they didn't live on a dirt road either. They lived at the end of a single file dirt track that ran through the jungle for almost a quarter mile. Here they were in the middle of nature, and they treated it like a trash can, after only one generation associated doing, doing business with the West. Um, but that's been the name of the game in Ecuador. Since the 1970s, when Texaco, now Chevron, came to Ecuador, petroleum extraction has been a messy and violent process. Some estimates argue that as much, a, as much oil that was in the, as, as was in the Exxon Valdez has been spilled into the Ecuadorian jungle over the years, while wastewater and runoff has gotten into drinking water, deforming the children of the indigenous groups that live near drilling areas. These activities, the destruction of one of the Earth's most, most biodiverse places, is motivated in part by America's desire for cheap oil, as well as profits for Texaco, now Chevron, an American oil company. I discovered a common theme throughout my time abroad. The United States does whatever it wants for two main reasons, either making money or saving money for the special interests of work. We have the possibility to change the world. There are millions of people working around the world on the ground in grassroots organizations creating change every single day. But that change is being outdone a thousand times over by the activities like the, by activities like the ones I described here today. This can be undone. Imagine the possibilities of a grassroots organization if they operated in a world where all of the power and influence the world powers worked with, of the world powers worked with development instead of against it. In South Africa and China, I would begin by restructuring American patent law 
and intellectual property rights, taking away the power to patent life, and making the pharmaceutical industry much more competitive by getting rid of, by, by getting rid of monopolies. By converting to renewable energy while using natural gas as a bridge fuel, we could transform not only our own energy economy, but create a completely green energy infrastructure for the one billion people around the world without access to energy. If this sounds completely improbable, then give yourself a pat on the back. You, unlike many Americans, unfortunately, are keyed in on the current political atmosphere. We have to worry about the budget, the deficit, the economy, and jobs first. So you would assume issues like patent laws and energy would, fa would fall by the wayside. Fracking is going to produce, produce a ton of jobs, right? Yes, technically it is. And it's going to bring the boys back home, right? Well, what kind of home are they coming home to? What I am proposing is definitely radical, but at key times in American history, radical ideas have kept our country as a global trendsetter. Going back to my idea of what sustainable development can be, if we increase foreign direct investment in microfinance, as well as giving countries credit ratings so that they, like everybody else in the world, have the same financial resources, um, we can give them the financial resources then. Uh, uh, sorry, I just totally messed that up. Anyway, moving on. Uh, changing intellectual property rights and patent laws with regards to pharmaceuticals and agriculture would make food and medicine cheaper in the long run and would be vastly more sustainable for our environment. Fracking is probably going to happen, but if it does, we need to regulate it to do as little damage as possible. What would be good would be a price on carbon, which would make renewables far more competitive by making, I mean, we would also have gas prices that are $5 a gallon, so that's somewhat unlikely. Um, what would be best would be to transfer to renewables, again, using natural gas as a bridge fuel. We have plenty of it, and, it, and when you burn natural gas, it has half the carbon emissions of burning coal. So there's really no reason not to do it other than the fact that you know, people don't want windmills in their backyard. Uh, the developing world follows the United States with the music they listen to, the policies they practice, and the aid they receive. You know, just a quick little side note, I heard Taylor Swift in all six countries out there. Um, that is the end game to put the entire development industry out of work, but nothing will happen unless we take action. The Lorax put it best, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to happen. It's not. Thank you. So,